Good morning. Uh, good morning and welcome to the Education Policy Seminar today. I'm Kylie, a PhD student um, in, at PolicyWorks here at the Curry School. Uh, this talk is part of the Education Policy Seminar sp series sponsored by the Bankard Fund for Political Economy. Each semester, Ed PolicyWorks hosts a number of talks that are free and open to the public. For more information on Ed PolicyWorks or the next seminar, please visit our website. Today, we are delighted to welcome Dr. Sartain. Uh, Lauren Sartain is a senior research analyst at the U Chicago Consortium. She has a bachelor's degree from the University of Texas at Austin, as well as a master's degree in public policy and PhD from the Harris School of Public Policy. She has worked at Chapman Hall and the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. Her research interests include principal and teacher equality, school choice, and urban school reform. Today she will be presenting evidence of the effects of elite Chicago high schools on students of low socioeconomic backgrounds. Her results raise important questions about the role that selective enrollment high schools can and should serve in a diverse society. She'll be talking for approximately one hour and leave 15 to 30 minutes for discussion or questions. Any additional personalized questions can um, it be addressed via email after that point. Um, so thank you for joining us today and please join us for the next talk um, described there. Thank you, and thank you all for having me. Um, coming from the University of Chicago, I'm not used to talking for an hour without questions, so please feel free if there are burning questions, clarifying questions. I won't think of it as an interruption at all. It's very welcome. Um, just for my, how many of you are students? Okay, a lot of you. Are any of you from Chicago? Nobody, great, okay. <laughs> Um, so I always do a little bit of explanation about what the University of Chicago Consortium is. Um, so the University of Chicago Consortium on School Research is a research practice partnership between um, the Chicago Public Schools and the University of Chicago. We've been around now for about 25 years, so I think we are the first research practice partnership in the country doing this kind of work. Um, and our hope is to do academically rigorous work that's also meaningful for the district as they make policy and practice decisions. Um, so the talk I'm giving today rolls right off the tongue, um, increasing access to selective high schools through place-based affirmative action, unintended consequences. So I'll do quite a bit of background on Chicago, um, why these schools are important, um, and how they do admission. So the underlying issue here is Sean Reardon and others have documented this growing difference in test scores between students from low income and high income backgrounds. Um, and we think there is a pretty big role that public schools play in sort of reinforcing these district or differences um, just because of differences in access to quality schools by income. Um, and so one of my co-authors, Lisa Barrow, has done a lot of work looking at this. And to show you what this looks like in Chicago, um, this is sort of a motivating figure showing cohorts over time of ninth graders in Chicago public schools. And we look at high achievers from low income neighborhoods and high achievers from high income neighborhoods. So the blue line is showing the average achievement level of high achievers from low poverty neighborhoods. And the orange line is showing average achievement for high achievers from high poverty neighborhoods. And so even though we're picking the top scoring students from both groups, there's this pretty big and consistent gap in performance between high, high achievers um, based on their income status. Um, and so this is the improvement that Chicago has been getting a lot of press for, this upward trend. Um, but this gap between low income and high income achieve, or high achievers is remaining the same and it's about a 0.8 standard deviation difference. And so that's the top quartile of achievers from low poverty neighborhoods, and the top quartile of achievers from high poverty neighborhoods. Yes. And if you, yes, I'll leave it at that. 
Yeah, and we think another thing that's happening is instead of doing this relative like high achievers and high poverty and low poverty, if you just look at absolute high achievers, the number of low income students who are making it into that bucket is declining. Okay, and this is getting at the access piece. So again, if you look at high achievers from low SES neighborhoods and high SES neighborhoods and the kinds of high schools that they're going to, um, what you'll see here is for students from high SES neighborhoods tend to be more over here. High achieving students from low SES neighborhoods tend to be going to lower growth high schools. So there is this difference in access to quality schools even by, um, even for high achievers. Um, the reason this graph doesn't look so nice is because there are a lot of high schools in Chicago, but not that many. So this, for example, right here and right here is one of the big selective enrollment high schools in our paper. So, affirmative action policies then um, can kind of come into place to try and address some of these access issues. Um, affirmative action policies tend to acknowledge that there may not be equity in access to high quality schooling and it may be by race, by income, and what we're going to look at in Chicago is by place. So one potential parcel, partial solution to this problem is to open up access to elite public schools. And so these exist in all sorts of urban districts in New York and Boston, they're called exam schools. In Chicago, they're called selective enrollment schools. And the idea of these schools is to provide a very challenging and enriching curriculum for high achieving students who are ready to engage in that kind of curriculum. Um, whether they're in New York or Boston or Chicago, they tend to rank very highly on these US news sorts of rankings. Um, in Chicago, or in Illinois, four of the five top high schools are these CPS selective enrollment high schools. Um, two of those selectives are ranked in the top 50 of the United States. Of course, that opens a bunch of questions about are these schools actually doing something to add value or is it they're just selecting high performing students and that makes them look good on these kinds of metrics. Um, coupled with this, everybody wants to go to these schools. So there are many more times the number of applications as there are seats available. In Chicago, there are about 4,000 ninth grade seats in these selective schools with about 14,000 applications. Okay? And then, for your reference, the typical ninth grade cohort is about 30,000 kids. So applying to selective enrollment high schools is a pretty common experience for CPS students. The purpose of selective public schools in Chicago, um, this is taken directly from their website. They say the purpose is to develop students' critical and analytic thinking skills and promote diverse academic inquiry by bringing together students from a wide range of backgrounds. And so they purposefully do this through their admission policy, which I'll talk about. There are a lot of other potential unstated goals for having these schools, um, which if people are looking to do more research in this area, I would suggest digging around here. Um, one is to attract families with high achieving children into the district. Um, one thing that we hear is if CPS didn't have these selective enrollment schools, you would lose more affluent families to privates, um, which is one thing because at least you're still in the city's tax base, but if you lose them to the suburbs, then you have a whole sector of more affluent families leaving uh, the city's tax base. Uh, to expand the choice set for public school students, I'll show you what school choice looks like in Chicago. It's sort of like the wild, wild west. There are lots of different choices. Um, so the selective enrollment high schools is one kind of offering, um, and if you're trying to have this portfolio-based approach to choice, you know, maybe that's why you have selective schools. Um, and here we ask in this paper specifically, do these selective enrollment high schools help address the differences in achievement between more or less advantaged students? Um, so the way CPS is doing this 
is through their affirmative action admission policy. In the past, they used to do race-based admission, um, but their consent decree was recently lifted, so they couldn't use race anymore, and so they moved to this place-based model. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what I mean by that. Um, but basically, this admission system ensures that students from the lowest SES neighborhoods in the city have a shot at getting in. Um, and because SES and achievement are so correlated, if they didn't have this kind of policy, um, their odds would typically be pretty slim. Right. So these are our explicit research questions. Do selective enrollment high schools benefit students from low SES neighborhoods? Um, on a variety of outcomes. So we look at traditional outcomes like grades and test scores. We look at educational attainment, both high school graduation, but then college going also. Um, and then we really expand on the current literature by looking at students' responses related to the schooling environment and their day-to-day -day experiences in high school, which is probably very important to families and students. Um, and then taking it a bit further, we look to see if selective enrollments can help equalize educational outcomes between low and high SES students. Um, so this is a rapidly growing literature, um, in part because the way a lot of these systems do admission lends themselves to a regression discontinuity design. So we are certainly not the first. Um, there are a number of papers in international settings where they admit students in a rank-based way across the whole system. Um, and in those towards kinds of settings, researchers typically find positive impacts on test scores. Um, but in settings that are closer to ours, where a limited number of seats are allocated in this achievement-based way, um, they typically find little or no impacts on test scores, little or no impacts on college going um, for students who are at this margin using a regression discontinuity. Yeah. Yes. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's one advantage of being able to do it in our setting is in the Boston, New York, your marginal kid is normally the lowest kid at the high school, but in Chicago, because of the way we do quotas, we see different parts of the achievement distribution. Um, but yeah, thank you for that. Yes, I know. We find, yeah, that you know, it's a little tricky, but um, so we find that kids, we actually find nothing overall, but we find that we can't even see any sort of like difference in, you know, depending on what you call in the distribution. Um, so. That's interesting. Yeah. Yes, sir. Back up for a second because all you know, rules based systems are great for research design. Yes. <laughs> uh, and at the same time, if one thinks about affirmative action and its motivations and rationales in the higher ed context, mm -hmm. there's a lot of discussion about holistic admissions and the use of criteria other than uh, test scores, yeah. uh, maybe grades. Yeah. Is there other factors in any of the, I mean, you think you could do better than just test scores in this context, um, and, and is there any scope for that? And I realize that's sort of wandering off of the path of, of, of a, you know, your research yes. design here, but. Yeah, you mean in terms of thinking about admission to these kinds of programs? or in terms of outcomes on these kinds of papers? No, I mean in terms of, I mean, in terms of the broader admissions question. Yeah. That is, why do we have a rules-based yes. system as opposed to a more holistic approach to admission, yeah. at least around the margin? Yeah. 
campus in Chicago? Yeah, I think that is a fair question. I know New York has been criticized pretty heavily for only using test scores, and not just using test scores, but using a whole selective exam um, that a lot of people aren't familiar with and that tends to, it seems like um, the students who are admitted are typically more likely to be Asian and white than the New York City population and also um, tends to favor males. And so I think this is part of the conversation is like who even gets a seat at the table and how that's determined. So I know using grades in Chicago um, I think Chicago sees that as being more holistic than just using test scores. Um, but what you tend to see, yeah. So objectify. You have these schools that are different. Than them. Yeah. yeah. And you might want to know. You might want to select those students for whom the value added yes. yes. is the highest if you were the social planner. And it's not at all clear to me that the test score measure is that maybe yeah. show that. Yeah, and I mean, I think like in Chicago doing, guaranteeing seats for low-income students, I think is a way to try and diversify the population. And I think at least we thought going into this might be students who would benefit more from being in this kind of school, and we actually don't see that. But um, let me keep going. Um, yeah, okay. So basically, the evidence on these kinds of schools is at best mixed. Um, the research that's closest to ours suggests that any apparent advantage of these schools is due to the selection of students. Um, and so, yeah, yeah. And so is that something that's also part of Yeah, no, and we try to get at this a little bit through looking at student surveys um, to see if their perceptions of their high school experience is different on the margin. Um, and so you can see if you think that's how it's going to But. I couldn't, I mean, you can see the same thing, you can see a zero, right? Basically, you're saying it's all selection, but you can also see a zero, basically, saying, you know, I get to the school and that's a kind of that number. Yeah. And I don't have a number. And I don't, and therefore I work harder or whatever. Yeah, that's fair. Um, so basically the conclusion that's been taken out of this work is really at odds with public perception about these schools. Um, like I said, these schools are all ranked highly, um, at least in Chicago and I know in other places parents are purchasing like test prep services to help prepare students for these exams. Um, we know also in Chicago, because this has been audited, that families will misrepresent their address to look like they're from a lower SES neighborhood in order to increase their um, odds of being admitted. Um, I am applying to, or not I, my daughter, I guess, is applying to kindergarten this year, and the same admission process works for kindergarten, and so this morning I was just Googling to see what tier we're in this year, and one of the search items that came up was, on one of these blogs, is it worth it for me to move to another neighborhood, right? So like, <laughs> these are very like palpable things that families and students are feeling. Um, and also like policy, CPS has expanded the number of selective enrollments, the number of seats in selective enrollments. So if this is all selection, like what's going on here? Um, so why Chicago might be different than other contexts? Um, these neighborhood SES quotas that they use really open up opportunities to students who might not otherwise have access to these kinds of schools. Um, and so you can see that kind of going in two directions. Um, students from low SES neighborhoods may be better off than their high SES peers at these schools. Um, and that could be due to school quality differences related to neighborhood SES. So what is my outside option in high school? Um, is that a bigger difference from students from poorer neighborhoods than it is from students from more affluent neighborhoods? Um, 
the selective enrollments might offset parental investments that higher SES parents can make that maybe lower SES parents can't. Um, but you can also tell a story that it might go the other way. Um, so students from low SES neighborhoods might be worse off at these kinds of schools um, due to differences in incoming preparation. And this is most closely related to sort of the mismatch literature in the affirmative action, um, is thinking about the intended beneficiaries of the policy might not be well prepared to be in more rigorous um, environments. So just a couple of theories. Oops. And this is certainly the case. I worry that you're not going to be able to see any of my pictures. But um, so what this is, is this is showing, um, again, just restricted to high achieving students. The darker bars are students from low SES neighborhoods, and the lighter bars are students from high SES neighborhoods. And this just shows the distribution of the accountability rating of the elementary school that you attend. And so if you look at the darker bars, about a third of high achieving low SES students are in low rated elementary schools, a third are in high rated elementary schools. But then if you shift to high SES, you see kind of the sharp gradient up to where um, high achieving high SES students tend to be clustered in elementary schools with higher performance ratings. So if you think performance ratings are related to school quality, which some people don't, which is fine, um, you know, you do see this difference in terms of elementary school experiences for lower and higher SES students. Um, the high school landscape in Chicago is quite complex. Um, there are about, it's probably closer to 100,000 now because we're losing students quite a bit. Um, students each year, very high or high poverty districts, so 85% of students are eligible for free reduced price lunch. Um, Random fact, this is actually going down, and it's not because students are getting less poor, it's because reporting's gotten worse because the district now provides free lunch to everybody. Um, and so for those of you who are interested in these kinds of things, free reduced price lunch across the nation is tending to be a worse indicator of SES than it used to be. Um, so, and then, We've shifted from um, a majority black district to majority Latino because the city population is changing. So about half of our students are Latino, 38% black, and the rest are white, Asian, mostly. Um, CPS is an open enrollment district, so selective enrollment high schools are just one of many options that families are considering. Students can apply to over 170 high schools, and each of these high schools has various programming. So a lot of IB programs now, career technical education, charters are big in the Chicago landscape. So families have lots of choices. Um, in fact, only about a quarter of ninth graders attend what we have traditionally known as in the science school or neighborhood school. So lots of opting out. And this is what this looks like visually. Um, so back in the early 90s, you had about 50% of students attending their assigned school. That's gone down dramatically. Um, and that's mostly due to the opening of charter schools in Chicago. That's the brown. Um, selective enrollments have expanded a little bit as well as CPS is converting schools into selective enrollment high schools. And that is because they're so popular with families and students. Um, so it's a popular policy decision in a district where schools are controlled by the mayor. So. Enrollment vocational schools going down as a matter of policy or because people are preferring to spend less? Um, so I think kind of both. I think the way that they're happening now is that they're being embedded in other schools rather than standalone vocational schools. Um, I know CPS has put a lot of efforts forth to improve vocational training. Um, and so this might not be an accurate represent representation of how many students are actually in CT programs, but these are like CT schools. Okay, so how does admission work? Um, the driver is still this 900 point application score, um, which as I mentioned, 
most districts just do some sort of enrollment or selective enrollment admissions exam. Um, CPS uses grade seven standardized, standardized test scores. So that's whatever test you take in seventh grade as part of school accountability. Now that's the NWEA, for example, in Chicago. Your grade seven GPA in core courses, so math, English, social science, and um, science. And then the selective enrollment admission exam. Um, and you're determined to be eligible to take that exam based on your seventh grade test scores. And the 900 points are evenly divided between those three things. So you have two tests making up two thirds of the um, overall score. And so each applicant has a single score that's used to determine admissions in combina combination with neighborhood SES and the schools that he or she ranks. So let's talk about these tiers because these are important. So CPS does this at the census tract level. I think what CPS would like to do is do this at the individual level, but they don't have a lot of information about individual circumstances. Um, they basically have free reduced price lunch, in which I said the quality of that has gone down. Um, so they take ACS data. They also take um, achievement data from the neighborhood elementary school and come up with an index. Um, and so the ACS data that they use are median family income, share of single parent households in the census tract, language other than English, owner occupied homes, educational attainment, and this elementary school achievement. So they take all of this together, they create an index, and then they take that index and split it into four groups that they call tiers. And so tier one is the highest poverty, lowest education, and lowest SES. Tier four is lowest poverty, highest education, highest SES. And the goal for CPS is to have about a quarter of school-aged population in each of the four tiers. Um, so this is probably going to be a pretty good proxy for individual circumstances if there's not a lot of heterogeneity in your census tract, but maybe not such a good proxy for individual circumstances if you're in a gentrifying neighborhood, maybe. Um, so how different are these tiers? So this is using 2010 ACS data. And this is just to give you a sense. This is average, so obviously there's a lot of variation which, within each of these tiers. Um, but median family income in tier one neighborhoods is about $30,000. In tier four, it's closer to 90. So it is a pretty big gap between those. Um, and all of these measures work in this way, except for um, language other than English, um, that tends to be about a third for each of the tiers. Um, but everything else is like monotonically decreasing, increasing to pay on the balance. And for those of you who have some familiar, familiarity with Chicago, this is what the tier map looks like. So the district puts out something like this each year. Um, and so this is the north side along the lake, like Lincoln Park, for example. Um, this is Inglewood. So it kind of it, it matches your intuition about the city of Chicago, where you have like the higher income neighborhoods here and Beverly down here, and then the west side and mid-south side tend to be the lower income neighborhoods. Um, you do get some interesting pockets. I'll just point this out because it affects where I live. So I kind of live right here in this gentrifying area, and you do have a lot of tier switching from year to year, which is another interesting source of variation. Um, but for the most part, you see sort of like concentrations of the different tiers. And the black dots are um, where the selective enrollment high schools are placed. So they have tried to um, place them in different parts of the city so that students have somewhat easy access to them. Okay, so this is how the actual allocation works. Um, as an applicant, you can rank up to six selective enrollment high schools. I think now there are 12 of them. Um, 
Most students don't actually list six. In fact, the modal application is to list one, and it is Lane Tech. And it's that school that I pointed out in that histogram where it was like spiked up. So people aren't maxing out their application choices. Um, then dis the district takes that 900 point application score and ranks students in that order. Um, and then they move through the applications using a serial dictatorship. Um, and for time, I'm gonna skip all the details of this. Um, but the important thing to note here is at each of the schools, 30% of seats are reserved for the highest performing students. It doesn't matter where you live, it doesn't matter what tier you're in. If you're a top performing applicant and you wanna go to that school, you get a seat. The rest of the 70% at each seat are then divided equally between the four tiers. And so the serial dictatorship then like puts you into your tier and goes through applications in that order. So you're competing with other students in your same tier rather than across the whole city for seats. Um, yeah. um, so this is just interesting to think about how 12 and 13 year olds think about their future. <laughs> um, so we also have a project just looking at all the high school applications in Chicago. Um, and you see a lot of interesting application behavior. And talking to kids, they'll say things like, um, well, we heard the best thing to do was to put the school that you really wanna go to second on your application. So um, there's a lot, I think, of misinformation out there. The one that they list as their only selective enrollment option is the biggest, and so I don't know if they then think, and I, it tells you something about their preferences. If I can't go here, then I'd rather go to whatever my outside option is. So, I don't know, that wasn't exactly informative. But. There are parents and counselors, um, but you know, I mean, we have heard things like, they, for the general application process, not the selective enrollments, there are two rounds of applications, and you can see families submitting for the first round, get their first choice, and then resubmitting in the second round for a different choice. And we have heard it's things like, oh, but then when we thought about what it would actually take to get from our house to that school, we had to re-optimize. Um, so I think there probably are a lot of students who are at least making their initial applications. Um, but. Yeah, I think that is in a chart. I mean, it is higher and the mission rate is higher for that group because of these seats. Um, so you don't see an equal like quarter, 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 quarter that get in. Um, and that's because tier four, the higher income students are likely to get this 30% bucket. Okay, so this is just an example and just to build some intuition about the RD that we're gonna be doing. So the district each year will publish these cutoff scores. So they're basically cut off each year. It's based on the applicants that they get. Um, and so Jones is a very popular school. It's located downtown and so it's easy access for people living in different locations. Um, this group of students are the students, the 30% of students who were admitted based off of their score alone. Um, and their scores range between 900 and 885. So there's not a lot of room for error, um, especially when you look at the high SES neighborhoods. Um, the minimum score here is 879. So it's very high. Um, if you go from an A in one of your classes to a B in one of your classes, that knocks off 25 points right away, which means that, um, oh, sorry, 875. So a student who had a B is very likely not to get into Jones. And that's assuming you have perfect test scores on both of the tests. So they're very competitive. Um, one thing to point out is the minimum score is increasing in tier, and that's because SES and achievement are correlated. Um, but basically what we're able to do is then use each of these four cutoffs and compare students on either side of the margin. Um, 
So our sample and data, we look at cohorts of selective enrollment applicants entering ninth grade from fall 2010 to fall 2013. So it's four cohorts of students. Um, we limit the students. We don't have to do this. We've done it all the ways. Um, to students who attended CPS in both eighth and ninth grade. Um, we don't include special education students, and that's because there's a separate admission process for special education students. Um, we have a lot of data. We have the selective enrollment application data, which includes all of your scores, but also your preferences in terms of which high schools you're applying to and how you're ranking them. Um, we have those cutoff score matrices for each school and each year. Um, we have the administrative data you tend to have when you do this kind of work. So we have enrollment data, test score data, grades. Um, we have national student clearinghouse data, so we can see college enrollment and college quality. Um, and then we also have annual survey data from all CPS students asking a whole bunch of questions about school climate, your experiences with peers, with teachers, safety. Um, all sorts of things in there. So we keep getting these questions about if you're admitting students with lower scores, on the surface, how different do these selective enrollment schools actually end up being? And the answer is pretty different. Um, so these are weighted by ninth grade student enrollment. And so if you just look at the average ACT, the average ACT at a selective enrollment is about 24, at another high school is 17. So that's maybe one and a half standard deviation difference. Um, but the other thing to point out is this is probably lower than what you would have had in mind if you were thinking about these sort of elite schools. Um, percent enrolled in AP classes, 36% here, only 13% here, so they're having different course taking experiences, the five year graduation rate at selectives is about 90 compared to 63. So they're pretty different experiences. So you can think about getting into these as being different. Yeah. So that's compared to the rest of the uh, average high schools in yeah. Chicago. And, and you showed us a graph earlier showing a pretty dramatic expansion in charter schools. Yeah. And so I'm sort of wondering whether there, during this transition, whether there's been an emergence of charter schools in sort of these neighborhoods that are very selective, and that some of those schools then end up looking fully as selective as these schools. Yeah, so I will show you that because this is also not at the margin where we're looking. And so, you know, one of our takeaways from this is that if you're a high achieving student in Chicago, your outside option's probably pretty good too. So um, especially for the students from the low income neighborhoods, a lot of them end up going to these kind of high profile charter schools that are very focused on increasing test scores and increasing college enrollment. And so this is always one of the challenges for us when we talk about this, is thinking that you have to think about both what is the selective enrollment doing, but also in comparison to what. Um, and this behavior among, I mean, high income, high achieving kids now have other options, and so it could well dilute the effect of it. isn't just that you're admitting kids who might not otherwise have been able to come earlier, it's that the top group may be going someplace else. Yeah, yeah. And we definitely see, I mean, this wouldn't affect our estimates, but just the behavior that we observe is just because you get an offer when these schools doesn't mean that you take it. Um, I'll show that also. Um, and to give you a sense of both how different the CPS population is from the application population and then our low income versus high income population, um, the applicants tend to be more Latino and what is not on here is white Asian. They tend to be more white Asian. Um, they are less likely to qualify for free and reduced price lunch. Um, they're less likely to have attended their assigned elementary school, so they were already engaging in the choice process at higher rates. Um, higher performing. Um, and then here you see that 26% of applicants end up enrolling in a selective in ninth grade. Um, so that's about the admission 
30 percent of the strength. But then if you look at our analytics sample, so now we've zoomed in at the margin, um, and breaking it down between students from the low SES neighborhood, which is tier one, and the higher SES neighborhoods, like these populations look pretty different, right? It's not surprising. Um, the tier one sample is about half black, half Latino, um, whereas the tier, tier four sample is more than half white Asian. Um, the tier one students, almost all of them um, attended their assigned elementary school, whereas the higher SES students were really taking up choice in elementary school. And that's because they have selective enrollment elementary schools in Chicago also. So like, choice starts early there. Um, you see differences in performance, differences in grades, and then about a 100 point difference in application scores between um, the tier one students and the tier four students. And that is about a standard deviation of the application score. Um, if you're a tier four analog sample, 58% received an offer to selective enrollment, whereas only 46% did from tier one. And then you can see there is some difference between getting an offer and taking it up. Okay, so this is starting to dig in a little bit to the counterfactual high school experience. And we have always struggled with how to display and talk about this data, because it's like differences and differences. Um, so if you have suggestions, I would happily take them. Um, but I'm gonna walk you through tier one and then pull up tier four so you can see. Um, and so the idea is, is the counterfactual experience really different for tier one students and maybe not so different for tier four students? Um, I'm gonna show you that's not the case. So what this is, is for the analytic sample, the mean at the margin on these different school quality indicators and the estimated change in school quality for students who are just admitted at the margin. Um, and so, Average ACT score is slightly higher. Um, so a one point increase on average, slightly more likely to be taking AP classes. So if you go down the board, they're kind of like these slight increases on all of those things. They're not the dramatic increases that I showed in that first table. And that is precisely because the kinds of other high schools that these students have access to by nature of being high-performing are also good schools. They're IB programs, these high-performing charter schools. Um, tier four, again, kind of like these slight improvements at the margin, but not a dramatic story. And if we test for the difference between this and this, we don't find that many differences in terms of the difference in experience that tier one and tier four students see. Where the difference in the mission impact. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, basically, this is our, our de estimating equation. So, yeah. So, we're looking at the difference of the cutoff in school quality. Yes, so it could be exactly the. Yep. Okay, so I'm not gonna spend a ton of time here because I think I've alluded to how I'm doing this a bunch. Um, this is actually something that we've struggled with, how to do the centering of the application score, um, and that's because you can apply to multiple schools. You're admitted, some students are admitted to their top school, some students are admitted to their bottom school. Um, and so what we end up doing, and we've done it in a variety of ways, is, Take, um, take all of the schools that you're listed, look at the school with the lowest cutoff and center you around that. Um, we've done the highest cutoff, we've done the one that you've gotten into, we've done your lowest ranked one. It's pretty, our results are robust to all these kinds of centering, but this was difficult for us. Um, and then this is just our regression. So whatever outcome, for student I and cohort C, in school J, in neighborhood tier T. 
um, and that's a function of your application score. The discontinuity, so whether or not you received an offer at the selective enrollment, that interacted, and then we have a bunch of fixed effects to take into account that each cohort has different cutoff scores, each school has different cutoff scores, um, and to get the neighborhood tier differences, we basically just fully interact this with neighborhood tier. Um, so this is what we're interested in. Yeah, so we initially, yeah, when we wrote the funding proposal to do this work, we said we would be including like a full set of fixed effects for every permutation. There are too many, like the model won't run. So we've done different things like include fixed effects for that, the school that you list top, um, things like that. We've done fixed effects with um, how many schools you're willing to list, but we can't do the like exact combination because it's just too many. Um, yeah, 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 because we want to get at this. So, yeah, um, I think those kinds of fixed effects are in the estimates I'm going to show you. Um, so these are the assumptions that within neighborhood tier, students with the application score is just above and below the cutoff or otherwise similar. Um, and we believe this because you know students can't precisely manipulate their scores, um, so we assume the acceptance is as good as random um, near the cutoff. So this is the distribution of centered application scores. So the line is drawn at zero. So that's kids here should be getting an offer. Kids here aren't getting an offer. You can see there are a lot of kids here. Um, and so this, I feel like, has policy implications for the district in terms of thinking about whether or not they should be letting all these students apply, if they get their hopes up, but they mathematically have no chance of getting in. Um, and then this here, you might think, oh, is there some sort of stacking here? And let me show you what's going on. This is the not-centered distribution of application scores. Um, and so you have a chunk of people with perfect application scores. And they're just getting in at some of these really popular schools. And so that's kind of why you have this mass right here. Um, yes? Is the score at the the lowest sort of minimum score among schools they apply to? Yes. So does that mean that everybody at the left end is not going to a selected admission school? Question over here? No. <clears throat> okay. So this is the probability of enrolling a selective enrollment given your score relative to the cutoff. Um, tier one versus tier four. Um, you have a little bit of stuff going on over here, and that's a couple of things. One, um, there is what's called principal discretion in Chicago. So at each of the selective, it's like such a Chicago thing. Um, at each of the selective enrollment high schools, principals have discretion over a certain number of their seats. What tends to happen is they just give it to the next highest performing kids who didn't get in. And so that's why you see this kind of jump up at the margin. Um, another thing that's going on is that at a couple of the selective enrollment, High schools, they also have um, vocational programs in the same building. And then the data that we get from CPS, we can't differentiate between students who are in the selective and in the CTE because they're just shown as being at the same high school. And so that is much more relevant for the tier one students than it is for the tier four students. The principal discretion is more relevant for the tier four students. Yes, sorry. Did I do it wrong? Oh, yes. Highest SES, lowest SES. 
Okay, so the rest of this is basically just a bunch of pictures, um, which I really didn't like yesterday as I was finalizing the slides, but I didn't have time to go back and do them differently. Um, so I'm going to show you first a bunch of pretreatment characteristics. Um, none of these things are statistically significant at the cutoff, so this is um, the likelihood of being black, like straight through. This is likelihood of being Latino. This is male. Um, so as a side note, this is a really big deal in Chicago because males are highly underrepresented at selective enrollment schools. And part of that is because they include grades. And girls in Chicago have way higher grades than boys do. Um, yeah. We do. They're all in the same regression. Yeah. Um, free reduced price lunch. Attending your assigned elementary school. Okay. So these are the actual effects. And so these, I'm just going to show you the overall effects, and then I'll show you pictures for the tier by tier. Um, so this is all of the academic outcomes that we look at. So standardized test scores in grade 9 and 11, grades in grade 9 and 11, high school graduation, enrollment in college, and then enrollment at a selective college. Um, so test scores, we're not finding a ton. Um, if anything, they maybe look slightly lower if we could get a little more precision. Um, but this is consistent with the rest of the literature on exam schools in this country. Um, there is a big negative effect on GPA for students who are at the margin of admission. Um, it, go, it gets smaller by grade 11, so maybe there's something that's going on in this ninth grade year where this is maybe a tough transition for kids. Um, nothing on high school graduation, small positive effect on college enrollment. Um, but then there's this negative effect on college selectivity. So they're slightly more likely to enroll, but less likely to enroll at a more competitive institution. Like, so I'm looking at like grade 11 test scores versus GPA. Yes. So great question. Um, this is a difference in enrollment in traditional or in ECPS school and the charter school. So we don't have grades for charter school students. So that's why there are slightly fewer grades. Um, this is an age problem that kids only get older one year at a time. So I think this now includes three of our four cohorts of students. Um, and then also to point out that the number of observations between ninth grade and 11th grade is pretty stable because this population stays in CPS and they're really highly likely to graduate from high school. So we don't have a lot of attrition in that way. Um, and then these are the pictures for the tiers. This is ACT scores. It's not a lot going on. Um, this is 11th grade GPA, and so I had said overall the GPA goes effect goes away, but it persists for the low SES students. Um, and so 11th grade GPA is really important because that's what is going on their college applications. Um, and so they're about a quarter of a GPA point lower than similar achieving students who went to a different high school. Okay. Whereas for tier four, there's not much going on. So there's something happening here. Um, is it that they're relatively lower performing compared to their peers in their high school? Is it an SES story? Um, we'll try to tease that apart a little bit. Um, this is the enrolling in college. Um, again, there was an overall small positive effect, but that's mostly driven by tiers two and three, which I'm not showing you. Um, there seems to be not much going on for these groups. Um, here's the decline in likelihood of enrolling in a selective college. Here it kind of looks like maybe there could be something positive going on. Um, and so 
we're wondering how much of this is that negative grade effect. Um, if there's not a test score effect, but there is this pretty big hit to grades, is that then translating into the set of colleges that you're applying to, where you get admitted, scholarship eligibility. So we're trying to get some data to be able to unpack that a little bit, yeah. Selective schools, do they have programs or interventions that are targeted to for tier one students or because I can see that yep. being a relative thing, right? Like you're as a yeah. you're grading students relative so do they have additional support to tier one students? That is a good question. I feel like that is a major implication coming out of this paper is like how does the district and these schools think about supporting these students? Um, if anything, anecdotally, we've heard the opposite where there's this kind of tier one stigma and people know who are tier one students and they're treated differently by peers and teachers. Um, I'll show you some survey evidence that at least they don't really perceive that, but when you talk to central office about this, that's kind of the response, is that, oh, schools know who are tier one and they're treated in a different way. So, um, Do you have information about how their application process is determined? Applying the same rates and not getting in, or is it they're just not applying? Is it figuring out, like, this is not? Yeah, that is a great question. So right now for these students, all we can see is if you enroll and where you enroll. Um, and I was going to talk about this at the end, but I'm definitely going to run out of time. So one thing that we're pursuing is this stuff called Naviance data. Um, so a lot of high schools are using this now. It's sort of this college counseling software. And as far as we can tell, it's a way for counselors to track where they need to send transcripts and letters for students who are applying to college. And so we're trying to get that data in order to see, A, the set of schools that students are even interested in because students can sort of mark their favorites. Then we can see where students have applied because of this tracking stuff. Um, and then in theory, we should also be able to see where students are admitted. Um, and so we're hoping that'll help us unpack some of this and then just more broadly understand like college decision making process for low income, high achieving kids. Yeah. Um, and then we have this whole set of experiential outcomes. Um, and so most of this is survey data. So. Um, Students talk about spending more than 10 hours on homework per week. We don't really see much there. They report on the quality of science courses, and that's asking them things like about the kinds of assignments that they're asked to do. We don't see a big difference there. We see positive effects on personal safety. The kinds of questions that are in that measure are things like, um, my peers experience bullying at school. Um, a lot of that sort of bullying stuff. Um, and here, a positive effect means that students admitted to selectives are less likely to say that bullying happens in their schools. Um, they're also more likely to report having very supportive relationship with their peers. Um, we don't see much on student-teacher trust or belonging at school. Um, but there seems to be something going on in the way that students interact with peers at selective enrollment schools that's not happening in the outside option. Um, this again, we go back and forth with putting it with the other graph. But this is incoming class rank, so your relative rank. And so um, students are lower rank compared to their peers than the outside option, which we think is translated into the GPA. Um, yes? For the, for the marginal student, is there a difference in terms of retention rate in these schools for tier one versus tier two? No, we looked. They tend to, they tend to stay in these schools. Um, yeah. Do you, do, did you run these um, throwing out tier four? Three, two, one, two, three. Yeah, and they're fully interacted, um, but we've also thrown out tier four because we were sort of worried about the students who didn't receive a selective offer just leaving the district. Um, and so it's not, 
I mean, because they're fully active, interactive, it's not sensitive to that. But what are you, what are you thinking? I, I was just thinking about these. I, I, I forgot that these were fully active. I was thinking about these effects. You know, I can imagine, for instance, the quality of science courses. These are, these schools are dominated by like, tier four kids, right? Uh, Is it maybe like forty percent of them. So let me show you the tier by tier stuff. Um. Okay. So this is the class rank. It's definitely a much bigger negative effect for tier one. This is personal safety um, and the size of the effect. Sorry, this is tier four. Is similar for tier one and tier four. We thought these differences would be bigger for tier one students. But again, I think it's the quality of the outside option for these kids is pretty good. Um, okay. I know I am running out of time, but let me do this one thing. Um, so we're trying to unpack a little bit like why Tier 1 students are having these negative effects. Is it something about SES, family resources? Is it just that they're the lowest ranked students relative to their peers? Um, because these two things are correlated, it's hard to disentangle, and so we try a couple of things. Um, the first thing we do is there are some selective enrollment high schools where the cut scores are very similar across the tiers. And so you don't have this problem of rank and um, SES being as correlated. And so we run it on that subsample um, and we find smaller differences in the effects by tier, which suggests that maybe there's something going on with relative rank. The other thing that we do is even in the high SES neighborhoods, there are still students who are free reduced price lunch eligible. So we take the subsample of kids who are free reduced price lunch eligible, do the same exercise, and these results are very similar to the main results. Um, so when we take these together, it suggests that there is something about your relative ranking in the school that's driving the negative GPA effect, and we think also the negative college effect. Um, so, overall, we find no evidence that selective enrollments improve outcomes more for students from disadvantaged neighborhoods. If anything, it might be the opposite. Um, but we don't want to downplay these high school experience outcomes. Um, students across all tiers report having better relationships with their peers a greater sense of personal safety, and maybe this is really what families are looking for, for schools, especially from high achieving kids who are probably gonna do well no matter what. Um, I've mentioned this a number of times now, but the selective enrollments do result in lower GPA, we think likely because of this relative rank story, um, and the negative effect on GPA is larger for Tier 1 students than for Tier 4, and it persists through high school for the Tier 1 students, where it doesn't for Tier 4. Um, and so we talked about how this might affect the probability that a Tier 1 student enrolls in the selective college. We talked about all of these different mechanisms, right? So does the lower GPA impact your likelihood of being admitted to a selective college, your scholarship eligibility, which probably matters a lot for these students. Um, one thing that we haven't talked about but is also a potential factor is does your lower GPA change the advice that you get from your school counselor? So if you have similar test scores but your grades are 0.25 points lower, maybe you get steered to a different set of colleges. Yeah. Based on the distribution of where these schools are around the city, uh, is there a difference between tier one, tier four, and how far the average student is traveling no. to go to these? So it's all about the same. There's not like a difference in time and having to travel. From no, they're all, uh, they're, I think I had that on there. It's but it's like not. Extracurriculars. Right, exactly. Um, and I mean, it's partially because they're kind of scattered throughout right. the city. But they still um, apply to the education, the application. Uh, the way people were applying seemed kind of weird. You said it, like they were applying one. So, but like, there's no difference in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Five miles on average, both groups are traveling. So, um, so, you know, one thing that we're talking about is like these findings may be consistent with this mismatch story um, where your 
concerned that you're admitting students who you want to benefit from these policies, but maybe they don't have the same preparation. Um, we're not like totally sold on this, and that's mostly because we think a lot of this is just driven to where you are ranked relative to your peers. Um, since we don't see a test score difference, um, there's something more going on, we think, than just a mismatch story. Um, but it does raise a lot of questions about thinking about how CPS should invest their limited resources. Um, you know, we raised the question about should CPS invest in improving school climate in other schools, if that seems to be the advantage of the selective enrollment schools, rather than expanding the selective enrollments or rather than having them at all. Um, but like I said at the beginning, there are some advantages to having the selectives. They are the most diverse high schools in the city. Um, they may attract or retain families who would otherwise exit. Um, however, having them does create a lot of uncertainty and anxiousness for students and families. So, policy considerations. Um, okay. So this is something that we're doing at our education workshop at the University of Chicago this year, and that's because we are a very interdisciplinary group and we have a lot of PhD students who come to our workshop. And so I thought since we were having our speakers do it, I would try it here and see how it goes. Um, so this is on the suggestion of one of our PhD students. Um, and so going through this, how did you come up with this research idea? How did you acquire the data? And how long did it take you to get from there to here? Um, because I think a lot of this is a black box. And so it makes me anxious to answer these things. So, so <laughs> how did I come up with this research idea? So I live in one of these gentrifying neighborhoods where our census track tier switches from one year to the next. Um, which changes my children's probability, basically, of getting into one of these. And so what I learned this morning was we are tier three this year and not tier four. And so my daughter's odds of getting into one of these elementary schools just went up. Um, so, you know, and then obviously being interested in like equitable access to high quality schools. So that's number one. Also, that was in 2012. So, um, before I had my daughter. Um, how did you acquire the data? Um, so I am lucky in that I'm at the consortium and that makes data acquisition a lot easier, but they have never been willing to share the selective enrollment data with us before. So what that meant was me taking off my PhD student hat, putting on my consortium hat, and going to central office a ton um, and trying to convince them that this work would be relevant for their policies and meaningful to them, um, and that we weren't scary. Um, but it also like relied a lot on our partnership being so long established, because obviously we're not painting a very rosy picture of these high profile high schools. Um, so, yeah. Um, and then how long did it take you to get to your idea from being able to present your work today. So I had the idea in 2012. I had my daughter in August of 2014. The first data work on this paper happened when I was on maternity leave. So I guess you can think about like starting writing this paper in 2014, and here we are in the 2018, and it's still not published. So like <laughs> the reality and fun of doing this work is it is challenging, and it takes a lot of time. And um, go talk to your district and state partners and convince them that you are doing good work. So thank you. I mean, based on what you've done, and based yep. on the reality of the school that you could be done. Yes. So I actually have a good answer for that, which is I think if I had been really interested in her doing this, I would have looked up my tier like months ago. Um, I, I think it's different thinking about kindergarten and high school. I, I'm not super interested in my daughter being in one of these type hyper competitive environments starting at age five. So. But I can say that from my place of privilege, which is 
I like our outside option, our neighborhood school. Um, it's 90% Latino, it's a dual immersion school, environment is very like happy and warm, and I think she'd do great there. So not everybody has that privilege. Um, so anyway, the other thing I would say since gifted education is like back in vogue apparently, um, is this is how Chicago does it. They pull out their kids and send them to separate schools. And so like one question is, is that a, effective, efficient way to do it. Um, I'd much more, I'd be much more likely to put my daughter in like some sort of gifted programming at a more diverse school than her being like just taken out and put with others like her, I guess. Assuming she's gifted, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> to be clear, I'm being recorded. She's very special. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think they're like regular high schools, but the curriculum is just more advanced. Um, so one of the high schools, for example, I spent some time in, um, they're doing like linear algebra and discrete math and all of these kinds of things. So I think it's, they're not like focus, they're sort of, you know, I guess kind of liberal artsy, but just like elevated. And that, that is a question I had about the curriculum. That's true relative to the alternatives that these kids would face, like these charter schools that might be more advanced? I think so. Um, so we started trying to dig in a little bit into the actual high school transcripts, and it ended up just being a mess. Um, but I think like the course offerings seem to be more advanced, but kids' reports of them don't indicate much of a difference in terms of quality. So, yeah, I don't know. It could also be that the extra marginal kids are the ones who are getting the linear algebra and discrete math. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. so if you said I didn't catch it like is there do you can you look for can you observe whether these schools help retain particular kinds of families in the district or whether they you know losing being on the other side of the threshold yeah so I know for tiers one through three there doesn't look like there's an effect of admission on attrition from the district but tier four, there is definitely more going on. Um, what we can't tell is if you leave to go to a private school in Chicago or if you leave the city to go to the suburbs. Um, and I think those have different implications for the city. Um, but I think that's a super interesting question in terms of thinking about, you know, Midwest cities in particular are just losing population um, pretty rapidly. And so thinking about, how school districts structure their schools and school choices to maybe attract families um, is an interesting one and important one. I want to go back to the curriculum issue a yeah. little bit. I'm probably <coughs> seeing this opportunity report that came out. And, um, so I'm, I'm interested in this issue about you know, your hypothesis and the data seems for the fact that these kids are um, you know, performing less well in a relative sense. Um, but part of that might go back to the fact that they were prepared less well yep. in challenging curriculum before they entered these schools. So they weren't used to being challenged in the way perhaps kids from IESES. And so I'm wondering whether that's part of what you're thinking in terms of implications for the district that if you're gonna be trying to include these kids and give them a a shot at, at some of these selective schools, shouldn't you be thinking about ways that you can prepare them to face those more challenging kinds of curriculum and assignments and whatever it is? Yeah, absolutely. And some of the district response to this has been about, well, we have to do a better job with our elementary schools then. And so I feel like CPS probably over the last 15 years has swung from being really focused on improving elementary schools to really focus on improving high schools. And I think we're starting to see them kind of swing back the other way. Um, and so, I mean, just that one of those first charts that I showed about like school quality, um, 
it is, it is a real thing that a lot of these low SES, high achieving students have access to low quality schools. And so I think that is a problem. It's also a problem in a district that has a lot of empty seats. Um, and so they're going to have to make some pretty tough decisions about allocation of those seats. And um, so I, I think what the, the anti-choice vo voice in Chicago says we shouldn't be doing this choice stuff at all. We should just be investing in neighborhood schools. Um, it's not like consistent with my perspective on life, but it's definitely in the air in Chicago. Is like, what are we doing in some of these neighborhoods that these kids don't have access to quality teaching and quality instruction? And then maybe you don't see this gap, and maybe you don't see this gap in relative ranking anymore either, right? Yeah, Veronica. Um. Like the uptake of selective enrollment, so it's like they're always choose not to participate in the selective enrollment process. Like, what is the default for them? And is there maybe an opportunity there for like, hey, you should participate in selective enrollment? I see. Okay. Um, what do you think about how to answer that with data? I think so. You have tons of kids applying and tons of kids who have no shot of well that's high school but it seems like there's there's choice based tuition even in the elementary yeah it starts early it does start Shows early there was like so many families not participating in selective enrollment in the elementary school yeah so i think um what happens is the only, it's not the case that the only choice in elementary school is a selective enrollment. There are charter elementary schools. Um, if there are open seats at another neighborhood elementary school, you can apply and get lotteried in. Um, there's just not as much of that happening in elementary school as in high school, which kind of makes sense as a parent, right? Like, I can send my high schooler on the bus up Western and that would be fine, but I'm the one who has to get my little kid to places, and in that sense, like it makes sense to me that you would want like a high quality school nearby where you live, right? Just from a logistic standpoint, you probably don't want to cart young kids around a ton. I mean, they need to move, and um, so I don't know the fact that there's less choice happening in elementary school is a bad thing necessarily. But I think one thing that the district is doing right now is doing like an accounting of what they call high quality seats and then sort of mapping them out. And so what you do see is even in low income neighborhoods, there are lots of empty high quality seats. And so I think the district is trying to help families think about you know, maybe instead of going to the clo the school that's like two blocks away, maybe going to the school that's four blocks away, but seems to be doing better on all these measures is a good choice for you. So I think that's kind of how the district is thinking about choice in elementary school, is like looking at the schools that are nearby to families and helping them make a more informed decision than just showing up where you're supposed to. Question about kind of preparation, you know, prior to admission to these public schools. Do the, the high performing um, kids from the you know uh, lowest performing tiers, the next poverty tiers, are they coming from all of the different? You know, you had like three buckets of school quality, or are they coming from primarily from the yeah high uh, quality schools? A good question. Yeah, I should look into that. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. We should. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you.